Why does total internal reflection happen? Here's the basic setup that we'll be looking at. We have some wave in a first medium that encounters a second medium. So of course, some of that may transmit, some of it may reflect. I'm not showing the reflected wave here because that turns out is not too important to the physics of what's happening and it will complicate the picture that we have. Now this could be any type of wave. If it's a wave, it encounters refraction. Being an electromagnetics person, I'm going to talk about this in the context of electromagnetics or light. Now in medium one, we're going to let this for right now have the lower refractive index. That means the wave in that medium is traveling faster, which means the wavelength is more stretched out. It's the longer wavelength. The second medium for right now will have the higher refractive index. This means the light, the wave is traveling more slowly, so it has a more compressed wavelength. So this difference in wavelength in the two mediums turns out is really fundamentally what leads to refraction and ultimately total internal reflection. Let's focus our attention in the wave in medium one. So it is coming in at some angle. Let's call that angle theta one. We can also write an expression for the wave. Don't be too intimidated by the math there. That's not too important that you understand the equation, but it's there for your benefit. Let's freeze time for a bit and stop the animation. Now we can add the wave in the second medium and we'll let this propagate at some angle theta two, a different angle. And let's think about the physics of what's happening here. What should the angle be in that second medium? Well, it turns out we need the wave right at the interface in medium one, but right up against the interface to look exactly the same as the wave in medium two, also immediately at the interface. So in other words, that wave phenomenon has to be continuous across the interface. Wave in medium one has to equal wave in medium two right at that interface. So we call that our boundary condition. If there was a step discontinuity in the field, that would imply there's an infinite amount of energy there, which of course is not possible. So looking at this range of angles, we see that this is very discontinuous. It's kind of difficult to get that wave in medium one to look like the wave in medium two. It turns out there is one special angle that does this. And this is why waves refract. This is called refraction. The direction of the wave bends at an interface. That's because the wave is traveling at a different speed on either side of the interface. So the wave has a different wavelength and it has to propagate away at a different angle in order to make the fields of that interface continuous. Well, we can set those two wave expressions equal right at the interface, and we can derive an expression that relates the angles and refractive indices. This is called Snell's law. This is how we quantify the angles of refraction at an interface. Now we're looking at an animation where the incoming wave is going over the full range of angles, and we can see that the wave on the other side of the interface also has a range of angles that always match to the angle of the incident wave. The angles aren't equal, it's the field on either side of the interface that matches. Here's another important conclusion to come away with. Notice the angle of the wave in the medium with the lower refractive index, so that's medium one, always has the larger angle. Of course, except at normal incidents where the wave is coming straight in and the wave in medium two is coming straight away. But otherwise, the angle here in medium one is always greater than the angle in medium two. Let's turn this situation around. Let's have medium one be the higher refractive index, so the wave is traveling more slowly and the wavelength is compressed or shorter. Medium two will now have the lower refractive index. So the wave is traveling faster and the wavelength is more stretched out. It has the longer wavelength. So a similar configuration as before, we've just swapped which side has the higher refractive index. 
Let's repeat what we've done. Let's focus our attention now on the incident wave, now in the higher refractive index medium. So it has some angle theta one, we can write the same expression for it. Let's freeze time, turn off the animation for just a moment. We can put a wave in the second medium at some second angle. Just like before, we need to know what the angle in the second medium is in order to satisfy our boundary conditions. Because just like before, the wave in medium one, immediately up against the interface, has to match the wave in medium two, also immediately at the interface. And staring at this and experimenting with all different angles, it seems very difficult to do that. It seems like this is always discontinuous. So we need our boundary conditions to match the field in medium one to medium two immediately at the interface. When we do this, we see that there is one special angle again that does this. This is refraction again. So whether or not which medium has the higher refractive index, we always observe this bending at an interface called refraction. Setting the two wave expressions equal at the interface z equals zero, we can derive an equation that relates the angles and refractive indices. This is Snell's law. It is the same equation regardless of which medium has the higher or lower refractive index. We also have the same conclusion. The medium with the higher refractive index has the smaller angles. The medium with the lower refractive index has the larger angles. And we can observe this. And we notice something a little bit strange. We're letting the wave in the second medium go fully from negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. But notice the wave in the incident medium, in medium one, is only going back and forth between a rather narrow cone of angles. And we might ask ourselves, well, what happens if that angle of incidence is a larger angle? So if we let the angle in the second medium be exactly 90 degrees, the angle in the incident medium is something called the critical angle. So that's the angle of incidence where the angle on the transmitted side of the interface is exactly at 90 degrees. We still haven't answered the question, well, what if the angle of incidence is greater than that critical angle? But let's derive an equation real quick for the critical angle. Given these conditions, we can change Snell's law a little bit. We're letting the angle of incidence be theta sub c instead of theta one, because that's the critical angle. And theta two, our angle of transmission is now 90 degrees. Well, the sine of 90 degrees is just one. So we can drop that sign out of the equation. Then we can solve the, what's left for the critical angle. Now we have a nice equation to calculate the critical angle from the refractive indices of the two mediums. The only requirement here is that the refractive index of medium one is greater than the refractive index of medium two. Otherwise, we don't have a critical angle. Well, we sort of would if we had a wave incident from underneath, but in either case, the wave has to come from the high refractive index medium to the low refractive index medium in order to have this critical angle. Now let's look at what happens when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. When the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, it creates a wave phenomenon in medium one that repeats too fast, so there's any angle down here that could match to that. It's impossible. No matter what angle we choose, it's just oscillating too quickly in medium one to match that to medium two. And so the wave in medium two is cut off. So what actually happens is we get what's called this evanescent wave. And notice it is a wave in the X direction. And in fact, there is power in medium two, and that power is moving completely parallel to the interface. These oscillations in the field in the X direction ensure that power is traveling parallel to the interface. There are no oscillations in the Z direction. No oscillations, it does not push power away from the interface, so power cannot leave the interface. The only thing left for it to do is to reflect. 
but it is interesting to observe there actually is power in that second medium. So it does get total internally reflected. However, there's still power in that second medium. And that makes sense. If there was no wave power at all in the second medium, we'd have to ask the question, how would the wave even know what's in the second medium in order to total internally reflect? Well, it wouldn't. The power does actually have to penetrate it so it feels what's in medium two. So here's sort of a summary of everything that happens when a wave is going from a high index to a low index medium. For angles less than the critical angle, we do get transmission and we'll still get some reflection that again, I'm not showing, but for angles greater than the critical angle, there is no angle in medium two that would produce an oscillation quick enough to match boundary conditions to what's in medium one so the wave in medium two is cut off and we get total internal reflection. Thank you so much for listening to this. If you like this type of visual learning, check out all the other learning resources we have in computation and electromagnetics at empossible.net. It really helps me if you click the like button and it helps me even more if you subscribe.